hemlock tree, a foundation species in the northeastern United States. This means they are the basis on which the rest of the habitat relies. Without them, their entire ecosystem and those surrounding would die out. Hemlocks are a very important species ecologically. You know, it's like they're perhaps the only conifer that we really have in the lowland deciduous forest. In an area where we have hardwood forests, the hemlocks offer an island of coniferous shade or these different habitats uh, that break up the landscape. In the wintertime, a lot of animals need hemlock forests to survive heavy snowfalls. And indeed, in the summertime, you get the trout. They depend on the coolness of the hemlock forest, the shade of the hemlock forest, so that they can reproduce. It's not just living things that depend on the hemlocks. The physical habitat itself, the natural terrain in which they live, depends on them to survive. They're a species that grows on steep slopes and gorges. Their roots make sure that the soil stays put and the gorges don't erode too quickly. They create a really beautiful ecosystem, and without them there, it would be very different. They're the last tree to appear in terms of succession, so if something were to happen and they were wiped out, they would be the last tree to come back. Unknown to most, in the northeastern United States, a small white fuzz appears on hemlock branches. It is light and soft like wool and collects around the base of the needles. This is the hemlock woolly adelgid. These white tufts are the egg sacs. The insect itself is really a small reddish brown to black sort of blob almost with just six little legs and a feeding tube that looks almost like the silk on a corn. What you see when you look at a twig is the wool that it makes, is that white fluffy stuff. And when it's not very prominent, it's not so obvious, but when you have a heavy infestation, it's impossible to miss. The woolly adelgid is an aphid in terms of how it feeds on the tree. So there are very, very small insects that attach themselves to the base of the needles of the tree and then suck the sap out. The tree starts to wall off, and at that point the tree will lose the needle, and the adelgid will move on, producing more and more insects on the tree at an exponential rate, infecting the whole tree, and then the tree begins to shut off all of its needles. The needles fall off, the tree begins to decline and die. You know, basically it's just this little tiny blob of protoplasm that's like a millimeter in diameter. It just puts its mouth parts into a twig and feeds on the tree. So what could be complicated about that scenario? But in reality, the response of the trees, the physiology of the trees uh, with the insects is, is very complicated. We don't understand so much about this insect. The hemlock woolly adelgid is one of 126 invasive species and 13 forest pests that have been confirmed in the United States. These include the gypsy moth, the Asian longhorn beetle, and the emerald ash borer. Each of these forest pests contributes to the destruction of an ecosystem. During its larval stage, the beetle needs to feed constantly on the interior of the tree. Larvae by the hundreds, perhaps thousands, tunnel in S-shaped patterns through the cambium layer, disrupting water and nutrients moving through the tree, thereby strangling it. The emerald ash borer, in particular, was confirmed in the United States in 2002, and at this point, may have already won the battle. By conservative estimates, there are at least 10 billion ash trees in North America. The bug is attacking them at an astonishing rate. The emerald ash borer has already killed over 900 million ash trees. After yelling timber 100 or so times on Saturday, the city of La Crosse has removed about 1,500 ash trees. 
$450,000 to treat half of the city's forest each year, and about that much to cut down and replace just 1,000 trees. The effects of the emerald ash borer are comparable to that of the hemlock woolly adelgid. So how did these insects become so powerful? Where did the hemlock woolly adelgid come from, and how did it become so prevalent in North America? The hemlock woolly adelgid started on the east coast of North America in the Richmond, Virginia area, probably in the mid-50s, on nursery stock. And since that time, it spread throughout the Appalachian Mountains and then finally up into the Hudson Valley in New York. Without any means to protect themselves from this invader, the insects spread. And at this point, uh, the Smoky Mountains and other regions of the south virtually have no eastern or Carolina hemlock left. Only skeletons remain where vast, old-growth forests once stood. The problem with invasive species and forest pests are that they are not healthy additions to these new habitats. In their native settings, natural checks and balances of their ecosystems have kept the hemlock woolly adelgid in check. Now, however, they are in a new environment that has not evolved to handle them. As the temperatures drop and winter settles in, the hemlock woolly adelgid begins to wake up. When it starts to get cool, that's when the hemlock woolly adelgid is out there. And that's when all the predators that feed on a lot of other things are gone. It's really important to figure out as soon as it gets into a stand, because that allows us more management alternatives. What I like to do in the winter is to go to new areas and uh, check out the hemlock trees to see if the adelgid is present. With an active life cycle taking place in the winter, when all natural predators of the area are gone, the hemlock woolly adelgid has an enormous advantage over the eastern hemlock. It's one of the most complex life cycles that we have in the insect world, where it actually has two hosts in the areas where the hemlock woolly adelgid is native, in China and in Japan, they have what we call the primary host is a spruce tree. And on that spruce tree, they have sexual generations. But on the hemlocks, it's all asexual. And that's the big problem in North America. With asexual generations, all you need is one individual to settle on a tree, and it can begin reproducing. So very quickly, those populations increase. They don't need to mess around. They just lay eggs, they hatch, and they get going. And there's two generations a year. So that's a lot of bugs in one year from one individual that settles on the tree. And that is the basis of the problem. So this is the big variation between an invasive species and a species that's native, where competition or genotypic selection has allowed these trees to live with the insects and not see mortality happen. Areas of coexistence include Asia and the Pacific Northwest, where the hemlock woolly adelgid and the hemlock trees exist together sustainably. As nations have developed, globalization has naturally increased, meaning more shipments across the sea, more transportation of products and plants. In turn, organisms native to one environment are accidentally moved to foreign lands. This phenomenon is not limited to insects, but also plants, ocean life, and mammals. Just as organisms are spread to the United States, they are also spread from here to other countries. They are any non-indigenous species that once introduced tend to dominate the habitat.
We knew that hemlock woolly delger was an insect that was in this area and um, could possibly be infecting the hemlock trees here in the city cemetery. Back in 2012, we found infestation throughout the hemlock trees here. We're here today at Watkins Glen State Park, one of our premier parks. Noticed that there were adalogids here and that they had been here for some time. With limited time and options available, forestry departments are turning to use pesticides to save the trees. Doing chemical treatments was a viable option, so we're trying to protect specific trees that have genes that allow them to become larger trees, bigger trees, in their various soil conditions and water conditions over all of our state park system. These pesticides are administered throughout the Northeast. They're injected straight into the tree or applied via basal bark spray to have minimal effects on the surrounding ecosystem. Whenever you consider using a pesticide, you have to consider many things. You know, there's definitely an environmental impact when you use chemicals, but there is also an environmental impact of doing nothing. So if we don't do anything and we don't do this treatment on these trees, they will all eventually die. As the hemlock woolly adelgid spreads both north and west in North America, individuals in cities are forced to either accept the environmental loss and remove the hemlocks or use such pesticides. However, there may be a better option. Laracobius nigrinus, or Little Larry as researchers call it, is a beetle native to Asia and the Pacific Northwest, which feeds on the hemlock woolly adelgid. It is the check that keeps the hemlock woolly adelgid in balance. Biologists refer to a natural predator such as this as a biocontrol. Our hope is that we can protect stands long enough that a, a classic biocontrol would be used to try and protect the stands. That's our, that's our best hope and then we can cut back on doing these treatments. Over 100 feet up, research is currently being conducted to see if Little Larry could be a viable option. Right now, Becky is making her way up into the upper part of the canopy. We are climbing to sample the hemlock trees, see if our biocontrol, Laracobius nigrinus, is present. The predator beetle was previously released at this field site to see how successful it could be at controlling and reclaiming previously infested hemlock trees. As far as the climbing to collect adelgids go, there's a couple of reasons that we do that. In order to be able to reach the ends of the branches where most of the adelgids are, you have to get up into probably the last third of the tree, depending on how large the tree is. Sean and the team use rope techniques, along with special precautions, to avoid any unnecessary harm to the already weakened trees. We're climbing up on these ascenders here, and so you're essentially climbing the rope more so than the tree. Uh, once you're up there, you're able to attach right onto the tree and kind of have two hands free to reach out and grab branches. We collect the branches and put them into bags. When we bring them back to the lab, we give them a little time to see if the beetles show up. From here, the team spends long hours counting the amount of hemlock woolly adelgid and Laracobius nigrinus that are on each sample branch, twig, and needle. These numbers can range from zero to around 300 per branch. Even though little Larry seems promising, researchers need to run tests in a controlled environment to make sure that introducing this insect won't do further damage. So along with sampling the trees, we're gonna mark them with the GPS unit, and we're also gonna put a small tree tag into them so we can come back and identify them later. Uh, it's important to 
be able to share our results with other people and show them where we're located geographically and also come back out and check on specific trees and see how they're doing. My name is Becky Sibner. I'm a research assistant with Mark Whitmore, and we are here at the Field Insectary, which we have nicknamed the Hemlock Corral. Today we're setting up some shade tents around some of the little hemlocks that we are trying to keep alive out here. Hemlock saplings grown without shade run the risk of being burned out by the sun. Becky and her team hope to shade the trees and keep them healthy, even though they only intend to infest them. Our next step for out here is to take some little branches from already infested trees and bring them out and put them onto the little trees that we have here. So once the eggs hatch, then the next generations of Adelgid will start to colonize. Once they have established a kind of a reasonable population, then we can start trying to bring the predator beetles out here. The team plans to create a corral with hemlock trees infested with the woolly adelgid in order to breed, harvest, and ultimately release little Larry on natural areas. For our research, we would be releasing them in areas like the state parks and Cornell plantations, and then eventually at some point they might be available for private use. I think the future for the hemlock will the adelgid in New York, I think, I think we really can control it. I think we have a chance. Some of the other invasive species that we're looking at, like emerald ash borer, that's a pretty grim scenario. The destruction caused by the emerald ash borer led to numerous public service announcements in the form of campaigns, websites, and films. No matter the targeted audience, they delivered a clear and consistent call to action. Don't move firewood. That's the message that we're really trying to get out to people today. And when people move firewood, essentially, they're moving the pest. It lives in firewood. You move firewood, you spread the beetle. Stop. We're not moving is, is the key here. We can't keep moving infested wood. Anything that's ash, people have to quit moving it. Yet people have continued. To many, there remains little hope that ash trees will survive the devastation of the emerald ash borer. Efforts to halt the spread of the emerald ash borer through a statewide quarantine failed, leaving no alternative other than to cut down diseased trees. The city of Minneapolis will remove more than 30,000 ash trees. It already infested approximately 2,500 square miles. Thousands of trees. Thousands of trees are dying. They have to take out about 5,000 trees. 587,000. Four and a half million ash trees. Over six million ash trees that we're going to lose. Dead trees coming down before they become a much bigger Problem. We can keep hemlocks on the landscape, and it's going to take an effort not just by the agency people, not just by you know some goofball at Cornell, but it's going to take an effort of everyone to say, oh, well, here's my hemlock. I value this tree. I'm going to try and save it. Just getting out there, getting more eyes on the ground, getting people aware of what it is. And if you do own a property that's along a lake or along a gorge, and you do have hemlock trees there, to really consider whether you want to do some sort of treatment on those trees. We're hoping with the help of volunteers, with the help of park staff, and a training program that we provide, we think we have a fighting chance to save hemlocks throughout the state of New York. Right now, the best option is pesticide treatments to keep your hemlocks healthy and alive. And once the biocontrol is a larger population, we'll be able to distribute it and people no longer have to use pesticides. I'm not going to sit by and just wait for hemlocks to disappear. You know, the old adage, you don't know what you got till it's gone. I think in a lot of instances, 
that's the way things play out with uh, forest pests. Uh, all of a sudden, the trees are dead, and uh, people wonder what the heck happened. As Mark continues to study the bug and travels the country to spread the word, few people still know of the hemlock woolly adelgid. In turn, it spreads, and hemlock trees, a foundation species, silently fade from our forests. Though there have been plans of saving and freezing seeds to plant after the devastation, the impacts of forests previously wiped clean of hemlocks may not sustain the same ecosystems and wildlife they do now. As the hemlock woolly adelgid continues to spread, this recurring phenomenon of invasive species is only escalating. Worldwide, organisms that were once separated and harmless in one ecosystem are now wreaking havoc where they are introduced. Resource, and we could lose it if we don't pay attention. <laughs>